In this video, I'll answer viewers' questions on how we make the MS diagnosis. If you'd like to better understand how we clarify whether or not you have MS, stay tuned, because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. If you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, please consider subscribing to the channel and make sure to ring the notifications bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming content. I love doing live stream Ask Me Anything MS Q&As where I answer your MS questions live on the fly. Unfortunately, I can't answer every question during the live stream. And in this video, I'm going to be answering archived viewers questions about MS diagnosis. This will actually be the first of a two part series answering questions about diagnosis. It is a blustery November 1st morning here in Central Ohio. I am sitting out by my fire pit with my Pikachu hat, ready to answer your questions about MS diagnosis. Let's jump in. Our first question comes from Jay Lowry, who writes, what do the O-bands mean when you get a spinal tap? Jay, that's a great question. Now, I actually have a video dedicated to spinal fluid, and so I'll throw a link up above in case you'd like to see an entire video dedicated to that topic. But to answer your question, it breaks down like this. When we stick a needle in your back, a lumbar puncture, and we draw out the clear CSF fluid, on the same day, we draw blood uh, from your arm. And so we have a vial of CSF, and we have a vial of blood. And then we do two investigations to look at the immune response in the CSF and in the blood. Under normal circumstances, a human being has a larger immune response in the blood than they do in the spinal fluid. And there's ratios and a bunch of numbers and stuff, but just to keep the conversation conceptual, if we identify that you have an overly active immune response in the spinal fluid as compared to the blood, that is a marker which can suggest autoimmunity in the central compartment. In other words, it kind of fits with what we expect to see in MS. Now, when you talk about O-bands, really you're talking about oligoclonal bands. And you're talking about looking at actually antibodies. And what you do is, is you take that CSF, that fluid, and you take that bloodstream, and you run them out in a laboratory on what's called a gel electrophoresis. So there's actually fancy ways of doing it. And they layer out, the fluid layers out, and you can see bands that form and you count the number of bands. If you have two or more oligoclonal bands in the CSF that are not seen in the serum, that tells you that there's an overly active immune response in the central compartment. And this can actually contribute towards an MS diagnosis. Now what you see on the screen here are those bands. And you can see how they kind of layer out. And you can imagine a laboratory technician counting the number of bands in the spinal fluid, counting the number of bands in the CSF to come up with that comment that there's excessive O bands or excessive oligoclonal bands. Thanks for asking the question and check out that linked video in case you'd like to hear more. The second question on the same topic comes from Ren E. Berry. Ren asks, question. Do the number of oligoclonal bands in the CSF indicate prognosis? Do more bands equal worse? And the answer is no. no. It does not appear that having a bunch of bunch of bands means that you're going to have a worse prognosis compared to if you only have a few. I would rather that you conceptually think of it as a yes, no, trying to get closer to an MS diagnosis. Thanks for the questions, guys. Question of the day. Cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, is made from... One, blood, two, urine, three, lymphatic fluid, or four, none of the above. Stay tuned to the end of the video to learn the answer. Upenda Singh Chuhan asks another CSF related question as follows. Hello, sir. I have lesions on my brain and spine. Also, CSF showing all clonal bands. But right now, I have one episode of optic neuritis. My doctor says you have clinically isolated syndrome. What are the chances for me to develop MS? Opendra, that is a most awesome question. It's a rather complex question, so let's unpack it. For starters, I'm going to link a video up here that talks about how we make the MS diagnosis. The second important comment is that I can't answer specifically for you unless I take a full history 
unless I do a full neuro exam, I look at all your MRIs and I look at your spinal fluid. So I'm going to answer your question generally. Now, the diagnostic criteria for MS have evolved over the years. And what they've allowed us to do is to make the diagnosis faster and faster and faster. And I'm going to focus this discussion on the 2017 revised McDonald criteria for MS, the most recent diagnostic criteria we have. Now, it breaks down like this. If you have one clinical event that is uh, reminiscent of MS, and optic neuritis is the most classic example, then we say that you have a clinically isolated syndrome. So having an optic neuritis is equivalent to having a clinically isolated syndrome. And then the question becomes, what's the likelihood that that individual with a clinically isolated syndrome is going to go on to have MS? And in 2017, there's several ways we can get there. The first way is that the person has a second clinical event. So uh, months or years later, God forbid, you have a transverse myelitis or another type of attack. Now you have two attacks separated in space and time, and that gives you an MS diagnosis. That's the first way. The second way that you can make the diagnosis after a clinically isolated syndrome is you have follow-up MRIs that show new spots on your MRI. Now, when you talk about spots, we're looking to meet criteria for dissemination in space. And the way that you do that is you show that there are MS-looking spots in different locations. So you had an optic neuritis, but you have spots on your spinal cord, you have spots on your brain, which clearly don't account for the optic neuritis, and that demonstrates that this has occurred in different space in the brain and spinal cord. And then you want to show dissemination in time. You haven't had a second attack, but if you have a follow-up MRI that shows a brand new spot that wasn't there in the last MRI, that teaches us the same thing. So we can use serial MRIs to get closer to an MS diagnosis. That's the second way. The third way is to make the diagnosis of CIS, optic neuritis, and then on one MRI, to have both dissemination in space and time. One MRI shows spots in different locations, and that same MRI shows MS lesions, some enhance with contrast and some don't. And the fact that some light up and some, some don't light up tells us that they occurred at different times, and so we meet dissemination in time. Now wait for it, because there's yet another way to make that diagnosis. In 2017 criteria, if you have a clinically isolated syndrome, an optic neuritis, and then you have an MRI that shows spots in different locations, and then you have positive spinal fluid that also makes the diagnostic leap to clarify that, in fact, you do have MS. And so it appears, based on the little bit that you shared, that you might actually meet 2017 diagnostic criteria. Now, I am not diagnosing you on the internet. I'm sharing with you how the criteria works, and I am certainly encouraging you to go back and have a conversation with your provider. If you'd like to hear more about this, again, I'll link that video up above so that you can check out more on the topic. And thank you for the question. Mary Rossler asks, has there ever been any research aimed at connection between autoimmune diseases? I have MS, one sister with colitis, one has rheumatoid arthritis, and my mother has an autoimmune disease of the lungs. Mary, thank you for the question. The reality is that if you as an individual have one autoimmune condition, you're statistically more likely to have a second autoimmune condition. Moreover, if you as an individual have one autoimmune condition, you're much, much more likely to see autoimmunity in your family, exactly how you describe. And it doesn't have to be another family member with MS. It could be a family member with some other autoimmune disease. And we see this all the time. It's very, very rare in my clinic that I meet someone that has MS, and when I take a careful family history, I don't learn about a cousin with lupus or an auntie with thyroid or a mom with rheumatoid arthritis or a brother with diabetes. It's actually very, very common. There's a very robust literature, and your family's example is spot on. Thank you for sharing, and again, thank you for the question. Jody asks, do all MS patients end up with a second condition? And the quick answer is, Jody, no. MS is enough. However, as my mentor used to like to say, sometimes nature's a little too generous. As I just commented in the last question, if you have one autoimmune condition, MS, you are statistically more likely to experience another. It's not a foregone conclusion it's going to happen. I'm just saying that it's more statistically likely. Also, 
There are certain conditions that if you have MS, you're more likely to experience, such as depression. People with MS are twice as likely to experience clinical depression. And so, whereas I think the answer is no, not all patients end up with a second condition, as an MS doctor, I need to be on point to look for those conditions. So if we were to identify them, we can treat them aggressively. Thanks for the question. Cool Katie 21 asks, are there any prognostic factors that could indicate the course of one's MS in the future? And the answer is absolutely. I have an entire video dedicated to prognostic factors, so I'll throw a link up above here so you can check that out. But to answer your question, there are demographic factors which would predispose one individual human to have a more aggressive disease course than another. Those are things like onset of uh, MS symptoms after the age of 40, male gender, non-white ethnicity, and various cardiovascular comorbidities, low vitamin D, tobacco use. There are also early clinical characteristics, the way that your MS has behaved in the first few years, that can also predispose a given person to have more aggressive or less aggressive MS prognostically. Those factors include things like frequent attacks in the first couple years, incomplete recovery from attacks, attacks that involve the brainstem or spinal cord, or attacks that involve coordination or strength. There's also features on the MRI early on which would predispose someone to have more or less aggressive disease. These are things like a whole bunch of T2 spots, a whole bunch of black holes, early evidence of atrophy, or lots of contrast-enhancing lesions. Most awesome question, cool KD21, thanks for tuning in. Kathy Riggs asks, question, hi Dr. Boster, well hey Kathy, what is mild MS and what is the difference between mild MS and MS? Kathy, that's a most awesome question. I think mild MS is hogwash. I don't think it exists. I think that it is a misunderstanding of the trajectory of the disease and that early pathologic brain damage doesn't play out clinically until 10, 15, 20 years later, which means that there's a lag and that you can have a false sense of I'm doing okay when in reality your brain is taking structural damage that you're going to experience functionally down the line. Now the definition of benign MS is not a definition that I like but it exists and it, it's as follows. People who have had MS for at least 15 years and their EDSS, so their neuro disability scale, is three or less. Technically, those people have benign MS, which I don't agree with, because about a third of those people go on to have active disease. And I've taken care of people in clinic that met that definition and then went on to have active disease. Moreover, an EDSS of three is not benign. These are people that have legitimate problems in uh, living their best life. And so I also want to point out that in that definition, they didn't look at quality of life measures and they didn't look at cognitive functioning. So someone could just be a three and not be able to think clearly, which I'm not okay with. The bottom line is, it's my opinion that a disease modifying therapy is an insurance policy against disease activity. And I want you to consider that insurance policy. I do not buy into this false concept of, oh, it's mild, so we don't need to do very much. Not okay. And now to answer the question of the day. Cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, is made from? The answer is number one. It's made from the blood. Did you get it right? Hey, village! What questions surrounding the MS diagnosis do you still have? Please leave them in the comments section below, and I'll answer them in a future video or live stream. My name's Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. If you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, click that playlist right there. YouTube Analytics thinks that you would love this video right there, so check that one out. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Just click that circle with my face. Go ahead, click my face. Until my next video or my next live stream, this is Aaron Boster saying take care.